Welcome to another edition of our series uh, on COVID conversations. This time, uh, we are delighted to welcome our own Professor Kamalini Ramdas, uh, who holds the Deloitte Chair in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at London Business School and is a Professor of Management and Operations at, at the school. Kamalini and her co-authors, uh, Lord Ara Darzi of, uh, of Imperial College uh, and uh, Dr. Sanjay Jain of Oxford University, uh, who is an economist at Oxford University, have, uh, have uh, recently published a paper uh, on testing for COVID, and the paper is just published in Nature Medicine. Uh, Kamalini, it's an absolute delight uh, uh, to have you here, uh, and thank you for being, being willing to share uh, your insights. Uh, really fascinating stuff. Thank you, Rajesh. Delighted to be involved in this. So, 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 Kamalini, you're a professor, our Deloitte Chair in... Uh, in uh, uh, innovation uh, at London Business School. You're a professor of operations management. You do a lot of, a lot of work on healthcare operations all around. Um, now, testing. Tell us a bit about the status quo around testing and, uh, and uh, what, what you saw and what your solution is. What is the challenge uh, that we're facing, uh, or at least as you see it in this context uh, with respect to testing? Okay, the major challenge is that there's a huge and desperate need for testing to be done, right? If you think about the population of the world, there's a lot of people out there and this is a pandemic, so it's all over the world. So we need a lot of tests and the challenge is that there isn't enough testing capacity available. So it's really a supply and demand problem. And here, a little bit of background there's, and I'm, I'm sure many of you already know this, that there are different types of tests. So the gold standard test is this reverse transcription uh, or uh, PCR, uh, yeah. polymerase chain reaction yeah. test. And that um, is a test which is done in a lab. It takes a few hours to be done. You have to send a sample to the lab, etc. There's not much capacity and, of and that kind. Lead? Yeah, just so I understand, that's the one that involves swabs in your nose and throat. Exactly, and exactly. So yeah. they take a swab, then they have to send that sample to a lab. It takes a few hours in the lab for it to be processed. Then the, um, the result needs to be given. And that tells you whether you currently have, uh, uh, you're shedding the COVID um, yes. virus uh, indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it is a very accurate or in the scientific language, what is called a highly sensitive test yeah. in the sense that if you have it, there is a high likelihood that it is going to tell you that you have it yeah. versus giving you what is called a false negative Correct. where um, the test would say you don't have it while you actually have it. Right. So this is, this is the gold standard, but then this test is extremely expensive as you can see. And, um, on the other hand, there are other kinds of tests which are available, which are um, much cheaper and they are what are called point of care tests. They can also be done much faster. And uh, many of those tests are antibody tests. So what they are doing is they are testing for uh, the specific antibodies that our bodies are generating in response to uh, being infected with the uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Now, the problem with these, many of these tests, and we know because we've seen in England and also in the US, um, in fact, first the government got a hold at, and paying large amounts of money, got a hold of huge numbers of these tests, but then, and they were even supposed to be distributed via Amazon, et cetera, but then a hold has been put on them because they are not accurate enough. That's what yeah. is being said. So this is, basically the challenge that uh, either you have this very fancy and highly expensive and very accurate test, but there's not enough of them, or you've got this other test, which is um, much cheaper, much faster, but you know, if you actually have the virus, maybe only 70% of the time, it will give you the yes that you have the virus. And then there would be the um, false negatives, 30%. Yeah. And, and, and you have some quotes from the various public health officials in the U.S. and in the U.K. Uh, so here's uh, Dr. Deborah Br Burks uh, in the U.S., um, U.S. COVID-19 coordinator saying, 
We're very quality oriented. We don't want false positives, to, to your point about, uh, uh, about accuracy. Uh, and, uh, and similarly, you have a quote from Chris Whitty in, in the UK. Um, uh, if they are not accurate, we will not release any of them. And, that, and that's your point. The, these may be more accurate, um, but they are more expensive and they take a while. Okay? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then the question is, should we really waste all of these tests that are available? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that this kind of test, the antibody tests, uh, you know, Rajesh, you've done um, lots of work in pharma and you know what a long um, lead time there can be, right? How yeah. long is it to go from um, a molecule to a drug? Uh, true, well, the, it depends on who you ask, but it right. could be, uh, it depend, uh, it could be a, a molecule to a drug could be in decades, yeah? Uh, exactly. Of yeah. course, here we had the advantage, this is a test rather than a drug, and therefore, yes. yeah. uh, and therefore you can imagine it will be quicker, and the, right. and the genetic information was provided early, uh, so presumably they could be quicker. Uh, and, and your point is, there is the opportunity for low-cost innovation. Exactly. So we've already got these uh, quite uh, rapidly developed tests, yeah. which are cheap and can be done very rapidly also at the point of care. They're kind of like a pregnancy kit mm -hmm. where you use it and then, uh, you know, after a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, maybe a little longer than that, um, there will be a signal in that little test kit, which would um, be an indicator Correct. for whether you um, have the virus or not. Yeah. Now, supposing that any particular test is, is not particularly accurate in the sense that it's giving you a, sometimes maybe there are false uh, negatives. Like let's say there's even um, as high as 30% false negatives. Yeah. But if you think about it now, supposing we could get two tests of this kind, and there are labs all over the world that are making these tests. You have mm -hmm. uh, labs in China, in fact, much of the uh, produce from China was sold to the UK and Turkey and other countries. But there are labs in Germany and in the US all over that are making these tests. So if you have two different tests, which you can think of as kind of independent, yeah. because they're coming from two different labs, and they might even be testing for different things. Mm. So like you said, um, the coronavirus is a pretty simple virus. Uh, but it does have, you know, several parts to it, like the uh, spike protein and the membrane, etc. And then each of these generates antibodies, and there are different ways to test for particular antibodies. So if you think of two tests coming from two different parts of the world, which are using slightly different processes, they're likely to be, uh, it's quite likely that the results would be independent. Mm. And therefore, and if, if they're both quick and cheap, uh, tests, you could imagine giving the same patient first one test and then a second test. Yes. And now the chances of two false negatives, you would just multiply the two probabilities and it's going to fall dramatically. Yeah. And so therefore, if you do three such tests, you could approach the level or two or three, however, depending exactly. on the underlying uh, accuracy. Uh, if you do multiple tests, as long as they're independent, um, you can approach using this cheap and quick test. You can approach the accuracy levels of the uh, of the high end gold standard tests. That's exactly. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. Yeah, yeah. And, and and therefore, um, now the, you mentioned in the paper uh, the recommendation from the from the uh, WHO, which is uh, uh, test retest oh wait your the the original uh, is uh, uh, test 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 is that right yeah right 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 and and, and your point is test retest and retest and 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 the whole point here is to have uh, slightly independent uh, versions uh, that makes a lot of sense uh, uh, and it, like many of these really clever ideas uh, when you state it up front, it seems like an almost obvious thing, uh, but uh, uh, kudos to you guys to, to point that, uh, for pointing that out. Now, what does that imply in practical terms? Um, uh, who should be, well, A, who should be acting on the insight that, uh, that you provide? 
And B, um, uh, as a business school professor, is there a role for businesses to do anything in this, uh, in this area? Yeah, that's a really good question. And you know, we've been thinking about it as well. Uh, definitely uh, one entity that needs to be involved is governments because governments are calling the shots on what can be allowed in terms of you know, what can the public be allowed to access because we know already that there are tests available. They were um, going to be on Amazon, but then um, they've been held back. So governments need to um, see or be convinced. Hmm. I, I think there's also, um, if you think of who's creating these tests, they are labs. Many of them are private, independent companies. And uh, Rajesh, you have also been uh, uh, a scholar of innovation for many, many years. And you know, you, we tend to think about what, uh, what should be the goal for yeah. innovation, right? Yeah. And one goal that one could give all the uh, labs and the, um, those sorts of firms in the world is to develop that best, incredibly accurate test. But perhaps, and that's great, you know, we can do that and at some point there will be that, but perhaps um, in the shorter term, a different type of goal is to, in fact, develop many tests and um, figure out ways to make sure that there are some independent tests. So that's yeah. a very different type of design goal that yeah. one is uh, trying to reach. And I think this, is, uh, this can be uh, used by uh, firms which are in that uh, test uh, design space. So let a thousand tests bloom uh, <laughs> as long sense. as they are independent right. uh, and provide reasonable, uh, ac reasonably accurate uh, indicators. Uh, by pulling across them, uh, um, you can have uh, you can approach the gold standard. It's a bit like I I, I don't know if this is the uh, perfect analogy. I'm I'm reminded of the analogy of having an atomic clock. There's one atomic clock that tells you the time till the very you know tenth decimal point, um, and that is crazy expensive. And some standards organization, maybe in Greenwich or somewhere else, uh, um, has has this uh, state of oh, gold standard atomic clock to tell time. On the other hand, if I ask you time and I check my own and 15 others check uh, uh, the time, we can more or less converge on the right time, right? And, and that's the beauty of the idea you're describing as long as you know my watch is independently set relative to yours, uh, uh, we might be able to by triangulating across all of these uh, get some, uh, you get a remarkably accurate insight. E enough at least uh, to to get get uh, moving. Now, one exactly. last thing, yeah. uh, Kamalini. Uh, uh, in the paper, you also mention that it doesn't have to be at the individual level necessarily. We could do uh, inferences at a uh, at a higher level uh, in groups, for instance. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. And this is something that has already started being done. Yeah. So, for instance, um, in uh, Germany this is being done. Uh, yeah. I know for sure it's being done with uh, testing of uh, hospital staff. So imagine instead of testing each individual, if you pooled blood samples, let's say you pool 20 blood samples and then, and you need only a tiny bit yeah. um, for any one test. So you may have drawn some blood, take a tiny bit of that and uh, from each of 20 people and create a pooled sample and then run a test. Yeah. Now, if the test comes out negative and it's a good, uh, strong test, then everyone goes scot free. If yeah. it comes out positive, then you could say, well, let's divide into now 10 and 10. And one of those two might come out positive. Yes. Right. So that's the idea. Yeah. And uh, once you start thinking about having 20 samples and then how to divide, et cetera, that becomes an optimization problem, interestingly. Sure. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and and uh, you, the key point here is we have tools to deal with this. Uh, yes. And these yeah. are not necessarily uh, uh, you know, RNA tests or genetic testing uh, uh, tools. Uh, these are simple statistical tools uh, that we can apply. Uh, often uh, applied in other areas uh, that we can apply exactly here. and optimization models, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so, so from your perspective, 
Um, who uh, you mentioned the need for governments to to act. So, is it simply a a um, a, uh, a mindset that says we need to have the most accurate uh, uh, information, or is it just uh, sort of people haven't thought through things? What would you want changed? Uh, who? Uh, so presumably you'll be taking this to the public health authorities. Um, what would come next as a result of this, what, in your mind? Yeah, good question. I would want, because it's one thing to have conceptual ideas, it's yeah. quite another thing to get this implemented. Yeah. So what I would want is, in fact, uh, experimentation where uh, the appropriate uh, folks who would be um, folks who uh, are very familiar with testing and either in the lab or um, you know, at point of care, to be taking different tests and using this approach. And, you know, I think they would hopefully find that it does work. And then the other thing that is needed, so governments are looking in, in their own jurisdictions. But if you have, like you said, let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, it's you need someone who gets the flowers to talk to each other. And that could be a body like the WHO, for instance. Mm -hmm. There's already one organization called FIND, F-I-N-D, which I believe is also in Geneva, which has created a big database of all the tests. But yeah. then if you, if you take that kind of database, but then put on this extra layer of, okay, let's see which very um, independent tests could be combined together. Yeah. And then also look at, um, for particular governments, what their, um, uh, you know, how much are they willing to pay? Because, even for the cheaper tests, there are variations in price of those as well and variations in accuracy. But putting all of that together, one could come up with um, suggestions for um, what, what would be appropriate in each country. And then um, if you think about just uh, you and I, right, trying to buy tests, uh, where, where would you go if you wanted to uh, buy a test? Right now, um, I was looking forward to looking uh, to Amazon, but apparently it's not available yet. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So with Amazon, for instance, you could imagine that um, every time, if it were available, if you went to buy one test, if uh, you could get some guidance that, hey, maybe you want to buy this other test as well, yeah. just buy the two as a as a package well, or, and, or, or include everything together and 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 provide a some sort of a, a means for public health authorities to also identify which individuals uh tested and retested and retested and found themselves to be that's a great idea so actually gather data through amazon yeah. for and amazon's very efficient at gathering data we know <laughs> that already right or so yeah. Other, maybe we, yeah. whatever it is but uh, uh, yeah. um, uh, some means of, uh, of reporting uh, that is verifiable somehow, right? Exactly, uh, exactly. Or those smartphone yeah. apps that people have been talking about. Right, uh, which would also lower costs. And it's interesting, Rajesh, because you've done quite a bit of work on disruptive innovation yourself. Uh, do you see any possibilities, uh, you know, wearing that disruptive innovation uh, thinking hat? Yes, yeah, so this is a beautiful example, isn't it? So in the, in the standard story of disruptive innovation, we say uh, the tendency among those who are resource rich uh, is, is to um, seek better and higher and higher performance variations, uh, versions of, of, of existing products or existing systems. Right. Um, and if you're a rich country, for instance, you could say that, uh, or if you have lots of time on your hands, uh, you could say that. Uh, but if time is crucial or resources are, are minimal, and this is very relevant to, uh, to developing countries, uh, which is a, a point you allude to in the paper as well, um, then uh, uh, what you could do, you could get be, be good enough by using other bringing into play um, other dimensions uh, that might that might push up performance. So in this case, uh, not a, a more accurate device or 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 a, a way of testing, but a, or a particular individual device or or test, but rather multiple tests uh, that are necessary uh, that are also cheap. Uh, and that's a wonderful example of low cost uh, innovation 
uh, that allows you to, to achieve many of the same or are good enough uh, to achieve many of the same uh, policy outcomes. That's a wonderful example. There's, a, um, there's a, uh, one other point uh, I wanted to chat about uh, Kamalini, uh, and that is the issue of, of uh, how this situation might be different in, in developing countries uh, relative to uh, developed countries. At least so far, it appears that a lot of developing countries could be very badly affected. Um, on the other hand, uh, at least so far, based on the rather limited testing, uh, it appears that uh, the, the virus hasn't uh, reached as many, as larger percentages of, uh, of the population as uh, uh, in, in some other countries. Uh, what you're proposing is also relevant there, right? So if you can pool, for instance, uh, tests, uh, you can, you can ap uh, apply to large numbers, especially if the numbers of, of the percentage of the people who are affected is very small, uh, that the, the pooling strategy would make especially uh, a good sense, uh, I would imagine, uh, because uh, the odds that you will find the virus in any one place, uh, in any one pooled sample uh, will still be low. So I, I see the relevance to, uh, especially to developing countries as well. And yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point because, uh, you know, how many you put into a pool sample is itself a, a, a decision. Correct. It could be 10, it could be 50. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, we could, uh, we could chat at length. I will note that you have lots of specific and very, uh, very uh, practical details on what can be, uh, what needs to be done. Also, the, the database that you were alluding to earlier, uh, in the paper, you point to what the, uh, the parameters that you go into the database should be. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, to read the paper. Um, and uh, I also encourage everybody um, to, to check out the other materials we have on the COVID conversations uh, site uh, on the Wheeler Institute page. But, uh, Kamalini, you've been such a steadfast supporter of everything uh, we're doing. Uh, thank you for, for not only uh, sharing your insights, but also uh, helping us see the world differently. Uh, as we face this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Likewise, and I think it is fantastic what uh, you and the Wheeler Institute are doing for uh, research at London Business School, and in particular, research that affects uh, the developing world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. All the best. <laughs>